just his grace, how great his faithfulness, how deep his love, how rich his mercy, how high his thoughts, how sure his wisdom. That's the prayer of your heart as well. Let's go in our Bibles to Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3. I want to begin 
reading in verse 1. And we're going to focus on verses 5 through 11 today. But this passage is going to apply itself for us in a very straightforward way. We've been studying Colossians on Sunday nights. And I thought I'd bring it to Sunday morning because uh, it was the message I had most studied for. So <laughs> we uh, thought we would do that this morning. Colossians 3, verse 1 through 11 says, If then you were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ is, sitting at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on things on the earth. For you died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, appears, then you also will appear with Him in glory. Therefore, put to death your members which are on the earth, fornication, uncleanness, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. Because of these things, the wrath of God is coming upon the sons of disobedience, in which you yourselves once walked when you lived in them. But now you yourselves are to put off all of these, anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy language out of your mouth. Do not lie to one another since you've put off the old man with his deeds and have put on the new man, who is renewed in knowledge according to the image of him who created him, where there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcised nor uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave nor free, but Christ is all and in all. Let's ask the Lord to show us what he desires us to know from his word today. Lord, we come to you in desperate need of your spirit to illumine our eyes to what you have written here. I pray that we would understand the meaning of these words, and I pray that your spirit would apply them to our lives. Lord, give me presence of mind to explain and exhort with all long suffering and doctrine today. I pray that you would meet with us in a very special way. Lord, do eternal work as a result of our time in your word in this hour, in Jesus' name, amen. The word that he begins with in verse 5, Therefore, put to death your members which are on the earth. That's pretty stark. It's pretty startling. If I say anything about putting anything to death, you become concerned immediately. Even if it's some sort of animal or something, what, are you sure? Are, you, are there another, no other options? No, put it to death. Put to death your members which are on the earth. What does he mean here? The word members is being used to represent all of the sins that we can commit with our bodies. That is the meaning of the word member is our, our bodies, our physical bodies here on earth. And what he's not saying is put to death your physical body, which is here on earth. That would be another sin that we should not commit, okay? Uh, we should leave our bodies alive, but we should put to death our members. So what is he speaking of when he says put to death your members? Well, he's explained this a little bit in Romans 7.23. Paul has said that there is a law of sin that wars in our members, it inhabits our bodies. It wants things that it shouldn't want. And it doesn't want things that it should want. And it stubbornly refuses to be subject to the law of God. It cannot be subject to the law of God. That is our flesh, we call it. And it's the law of sin that wars in our members. That is what we are talking about this morning. James, another apostle, wrote in James chapter 4, verse 1, from where do wars and fights come from among you? Well, they come from the lusts that war in your members, in your bodies. You want something, and so you go about getting it, and you bump into your neighbor who doesn't want that, and so you fight with your neighbor. There is conflict there because of the lusts, the desire for pleasure that war in our members. And so this verse is telling us that we are to kill 
something in our members. Well, what is it? We're to kill sin. We are going to talk this morning about killing sin, not in other people. Okay, We're going to talk about killing sin in ourselves. And we have, as we've studied this passage, this book and other messages, we've uncovered some precious truths about our union with Christ. However, those truths shouldn't lead us to inactivity. We've learned that we are one with Christ. We're going to remind ourselves of that in just a moment. But that doesn't lead me to inactivity. I can't just sit back and say, well, God's got it all figured out. God's got it all covered. If you try that in your Christian life, you're going to be in for a rude awakening. This passage ex- explains and applies what it means to be in Christ. Therefore, put to death your members. We need to kill sin in order that we may continue to enjoy our restful identity with Christ. It takes vigilance. If I could use an illustration, we live in a free country, and I'm so thankful for the free country that we have. But we live in a free country because of a vigilant military over the years that has kept the battles on the enemy's shores instead of ours. We live in freedom in Christ, but we must kill sin. Now, it's not up to us to kill sin. It's not just my duty to figure out how to do this and go whack at sin. God is going to lead us in this conflict, but the battlefield is our hearts. John Owen lived hundreds of years ago. He was a Puritan and he wrote, Be killing sin or it will be killing you. Around the turn of the latest century here. That's crazy to say it that way. The turn of the century. Back in 2001. There was an attack in New York City and Washington, D.C. and the country of Pennsylvania, the countryside of Pennsylvania. And we learned from that attack that they were coming for us. We fought an enemy and they were coming for us. And the mentality that we adopted then was we will go to them before they get to us. That is a good illustration of what we do with sin. And we're going to see at the end here in Galatians chapter 5 that if you walk after the Spirit, you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh because the next verse says the Spirit or the flesh lusts against the Spirit and the Spirit lusts against the flesh. Basically, they both pick on each other so that you can't do the things that you would. But if you walk under the Spirit, if you walk after the Spirit, He's going to pick on the flesh and you will find yourself killing sin left and right. And that's how we kill sin. But we must adopt that mentality, be killing sin or it will be killing you. I may be speaking to someone today that sin is killing you. It's got a stranglehold on your life. You don't know what to do. You're powerless against it. There is hope. This passage gives hope. God wants to help you. But we need to see, why does Paul give this command at this point in the letter? We need to see, first of all, that I must kill sin if I am to live from above. That is why Paul says it right here. He's explained what it means. Last week we explained what it meant to live from above, that we have been identified with Christ and true believers live their lives from above. We have a new identity in Christ. And we read about it in verses 1 through 5 and that we are risen with Christ. We've died with Him. We've risen with Him. It says, we, verse 3, you died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. We are immersed into Christ's life so that what is true of Him is true of us. Think coffee and cream and sugar or tea and cream and sugar or whatever else you like and cream and sugar or whatever you mix into your drink. When you mix that together, it becomes a new creation. And you cannot separate those elements if you tried. We are immersed. We are mixed into Christ's life so that Christ's victory is my victory. I'm connected with Him. I have His power. I have His presence. I can live in fellowship with Jesus. 
from day to day. But I have to kill sin if I'm going to do that. Because he's going to lead me to kill sin. This command is a further application of our position in Christ. Paul is saying you're in Christ. This is the action that you take as you're in Christ. Kill sin. This command is also a further application of our privilege to live from above. Not only our position, but our privilege to live from above. He says, set your mind on things above. Seek the things that are above. What are those things? Well, they're God's will, His kingdom, His glory. And in seeking these things above, we must set our mind on them instead of earthly things. This doesn't mean that we pay no attention to earthly needs. If your car is broke down, you fix your car, but you fix your car to the glory of God. I had two flat tires this week. Oh, my. Took the flat tire off, put the donut tire on. The car came off the jack, and the donut tire was flat. Took a picture and sent it to some. So what is wrong with this picture? Um, You know, God... God intends to use those situations to mold us into His image. But I can't say, well, Lord, I, can't, I, don't, I don't have time to seek the things above. I'm stuck here by Target over here, and i got to fix this tire right now. I don't have time to seek things above. No, I seek things above by fixing my tire. And by submitting myself to the Lord and being kind to those around me and not... Uh, losing my uh, presence of mind and, and walking with the Lord. And I remember as I sat there praying, Lord, I know you're up to something. I know that you're doing something in my life because my donut tire's flat. I mean, it's pretty obvious that I'm not going anywhere. And, and it was a trial. I wish I could say I went through it without sinning. But I was mindful of this and I think the Lord helped me through that trial and reminded me seek the things that are above not to the exclusion of earthly things no those who truly seek things above take care of the earthly things better than those who seek things below think about that those who seek things above take better care of their earthly things than those who seek the things on the earth because God takes better care of us than we can of ourselves So he's calling us, set your mind on things above. Live out your position in Christ. Live from above. And then he links this to our sinful members on the earth. So if I could just remind you of the context. You've seen in verse 2, set your mind on things above, not on things on the earth. We just talked about that. You're dead. You died. Your life is hidden with Christ in God. Christ is going to appear. We're going to appear with Him in glory. Therefore, put to death your members. What is the next phrase? Which are on the earth. What's the significance of that? Well, He's just said, seek those things that are above. Put to death your members which are on the earth because they're not things from above. Put to death your sins which are on the earth. So He's commanding us to set our minds upon things above and not on these things on the earth. He points out that our members are upon the earth. And these members upon the earth are the sins that so easily beset us. And they stubbornly oppose our seeking things above. And they have to be killed. They have to be put to death. What members are we talking about? Well, I can't tell you which members you struggle with. I can tell you which ones I struggle with. But the Lord tells us which ones he's concerned about. He gives us some examples here. This is not an exhaustive list by any stretch of the imagination, but Paul tells us that we need to watch out for these specific sins. And he's making an implication here. Paul implies the need for vigilance by listing 12 specific sins. So I'm concerned, I'm I'm worried about the fact that we say, well, you're... One with Christ, you have His power, you have His presence, you have His grace. You can just rest in Him, and you don't have to do anything to live for the Lord except rest in Jesus. Now, that's 
there's, that's partially true. But I'm missing something huge, and I'm in for a very, very rude awakening. He's saying, you are dead. Your life is hidden with Christ in God. You can rest in Him. You can put your trust. You can live in His presence. But you better watch out for these sins. There's 12 of them. And enlisting these 12 sins, he's saying it's not all just an easy path through the woods. You're going to come to these spots and you're going to be tempted. So beware. Kill sin or it will be killing you. You say, well, how does that work with rest? We'll get to that in a second. You can be restful in Jesus Christ and still kill sin. But you cannot be restful in Jesus Christ and not kill sin. If your life, you say, well, I'm just resting in the Lord and you don't kill sin, you're not resting in the Lord. You're deceived. He actually says that. Don't be deceived. So he gives us 12 specific sins that we are to kill. Verse 5, therefore put to death your members which are on the earth. The first one is what? Fornication. We get the English word pornography from the Greek word here for fornication. It refers specifically to the physical illicit acts of immorality. And this is interesting. In the Greco-Roman culture, this word, this concept, um, was not regarded as especially reprehensible. It wasn't something that was looked down on back then. To be immoral, to commit fornication was sort of the stuff of life in the Greco-Roman world. We don't need any other illustrations of that. I'm sure we can uh, understand what, we're, what they're saying there. We say, well, that, that was back then. That was pretty bad. I read a study of Americans from 1954 to 2003. It was published in 2007 it found that 94% of Americans were immoral before marriage. And the conclusion that was stated was indicating that this is normal behavior for the vast majority of Americans and has been for decades. Think of that, 94% of Americans were immoral before marriage. It doesn't differentiate between Christians or unsaved. 94% of Americans, what does that tell you about our culture? tells us that we are just the same as the Greco-Roman culture. It's not looked down on in our society today. Fornication is all over our society. It is joked about, it's alluded to, it's snickered at, and sadly even by disciples of Jesus. And I believe we, if we were all honest, there would be times that we would have to admit, myself included, that we have snickered at fornication. An off-color joke has been told. Something comes on the television and we're not vigilant about it. We don't turn it off. We don't change the channel. We don't, we don't deal with something. We, it's a, maybe it's not on television. Maybe it's on the internet. Whatever it is, it pervades our culture. It pervades, I'm going to say carefully and lovingly, I think it pervades our church. I think we need to be vigilant about this. Don't let yourself think that, well, that's outside the walls. 94% of Americans were immoral before marriage. It's pervading our culture. It pervades our lives. We need to be vigilant. That's my point. I say that lovingly. I'm not saying that judgmentally. If you struggle with that, if you have struggled with that, I long to help you. We long to help you. Because we all face this sin in our culture. And we must be vigilant against it. Put it to death. I'm glad he's so stark about that. Can you put something to death and it still live? No. We go deer hunting. One of the first processes that we go through when we come up on the deer in the woods after shooting it is to make sure it is dead. Because it gets really interesting when it gets in the back of your truck and it's not dead. It's never happened, but I hope it never does. At least it's happened not to me. I've seen it on YouTube before. Um, people, crazy things happen. You cannot kill something and it remain alive. 
Paul says, kill it. Kill it in your life. Kill it. Fornication. Secondly, uncleanness. This is a broader term that includes fornication. It refers to the lifestyle of immorality. Very broad term. In uncleanness. Just not proper, not fitting, not godly. The next word he uses here is passion. This refers to depraved passion for evil things. It is a strong word. It is energetic. It is unbridled. It won't take no for an answer. I think of a mob of people that want something. And they've got their signs and they're pounding on things. They're willing to do whatever it takes. They're in a fit of passion. It's like a mob mentality, only it's on a personal basis. And it's depraved. It's a passion for evil things. They will have it or they'll destroy the world to get it. Passion. Evil desire. This is also a strong desire for evil. Think of wicked cravings. Maybe not as strong as passion, but the idea is there. Then the last word here, the last sin, covetousness. A greedy desire to have more. And why does it want more things? Because it defines itself, they define themselves, they define their worth by the things that they have. It looks to things for, for fulfillment instead of God. And Paul just adds this in for us. Covetousness, which is the sixth sin, idolatry. Looking to something other than God for fulfillment. Covetousness. What are we to do with these things? We're to kill them. We're to put them to death. I'm going to skip to the next list down in the next verse, verse 8. But now you yourselves are to put off all these anger. This is an abiding, settled, habitual anger that includes the purpose of revenge. It's a simmering anger. Bitterness, I think, is tied in with this. An anger at someone, something. Dissatisfaction, and it's habitual, it's settled. Think of a pot on the stove that is simmering. The next word is wrath. Think of your pot boiling over. The lid coming flying off. And it's boiling over anger. It's the violent agitation of feelings. It's outbursts of violence. Or outbursts of anger. Words are said at this point where that we would never say. Wrath. Put it away. Kill it. Malice is a feeling, an attitude that wishes or does harm to another. Takes pleasure when someone else is hurt or has a problem. It's a desire for someone to be hurt. Malice. Kill it. Blasphemy. This is slander of a person. Slander of the Lord, even. Kill it. Don't put up with it in your life or take steps to kill it. Filthy language. Low and obscene speech. Someone called it locker room talk. Gutter talk. Kill it. Don't entertain it. And then lying. Shading the truth. Stretching the truth. Changing the truth. Misrepresenting the truth. Just an outright lie. Kill it. That has no part in a Christian's life. Now that's a long list. It's 12 things that we need to guard against. But you get the idea from that list that he can't list everything that we struggle with. He can't list everything that is boiling in our hearts. But he's making a point. Kill sin or it will be killing you. He also uses two verb tenses to describe killing sin. In this passage, the verb tense, when he says mortify or put to death, therefore your members, in verse 5, that tense indicates that it is a once for all killing of sin. Once for all. You kill it, it's dead, it doesn't come back to life. But I want you to go to Romans 8.13. 
parallel passage here. Romans 8.13. Same writer using the same concept. Verse 13. And he says, For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if you, by the Spirit, put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. And what we're interested in is the words putting to death here. Put to death. The tense on that verb, it's a single verb, is a continual killing of sin. So, once for all killing in Colossians 3.5, a continual killing of sin. A continual persistent battle against sin. Which one is right? Well, both of them are true. We daily revisit and apply the once for all killing of sin. Think of those words. We daily revisit and apply the once for all killing of sin. And in that sense, we're killing sin daily by applying what God has already done on a daily basis. Paul is very practical here. But what makes this sin so powerful that I must continually kill it? We've seen that I must kill sin if I am to live from above. If I'm to live out my position in Christ, these sins will come at me and I must take action against them or they will kill me. I must do it on a once for all basis and on a daily basis. But secondly, I must kill sin because it is an expression of what I used to be. I have to kill sin. You have to kill sin because it's an expression of what you used to be. Look at the next verses in Colossians, back in Colossians 3. He lists the first list in verse 5. Now look at uh, verse 6. Because of these things, fornication, uncleanness, passion, evil desire, covetousness, idolatry, because of these things, the wrath of God is coming upon the sons of disobedience. What he's saying there is there's a visual difference between God's children and the children of disobedience that he's soon going to destroy. He's saying, no, 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 kill sin in your life because for these things, there's this group of people over here and the wrath of God is coming upon them. They're not children of God. They're the children of disobedience. So you don't walk in these sins. There should be a visual difference. And I'll say it from this perspective, there is a visual difference. God's children, God's genuine children, kill sin. If you've never killed a sin in your life, I think this passage points and it says to you, God's children kill sin. If you're God's child, you're going to kill sin. Living people breathe. If you're not breathing, what are you? Dead. Okay. If you're not killing sin, what are you? This passage is implying that you need, to, you need to seriously consider whether you've actually put your trust in the Lord Jesus because God's people don't sit here and just walk in sin. They kill sin. There is a visual difference between God's children and the children of obedience, disobedience that He's going to destroy. It says it right there. Uh, because of these things, the wrath of God is coming upon the sons of disobedience. Verse 7, in which you yourselves once walked when you lived in them. Now, I'm not saying, let me clarify this, that a Christian can't sin. Christians sin all the time. How many of you sin this week? Okay. Yes, we all sin, but a Christian does not live continually and celebrate sin. They feel terrible after they sin. They kill sin. They work to kill sin. Continuing is sin in sin is a celebration of our life before Jesus. Verse 7, in which you once walked. He's saying you once did this before you were saved, before you trusted Christ. These behaviors were prevalent in the Colossians. And they were prevalent in the Corinthians before they were saved. Paul said, he lists these sins in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, all of these terrible sins, and he points at his at his. Readers, and he says, and such were some of you. You struggled with these things. You actually didn't struggle with them. You celebrated them. You lived in them. That was your life. And he says, but now you're washed. You're justified. And the habits and memories 
were still present in these people's lives and they would take over again if they allowed. So continuing in sin is a celebration of our life before Jesus. If you go back and you sin and you walk in this sin and you're not habitually killing sin, you're celebrating, we're celebrating our life before Jesus. And that is a terrible thing to do with the life that he's given us. Continuing in sin will also destroy a believer's life in Christ. This is scary at this point. If you live according to the flesh, Romans 8.13, we read it. If you live according to the flesh, you will die. Now, I do not personally believe that that word die in, this, in that verse is indicating that you will spiritually die. Because Christ has justified his people. I think that he's using it in the sense that he used it in 1 Thessalonians 3.18. He said, for now we live if you stand fast in the Lord. He says, my life is bound up in you. And if you stand fast in the Lord, I live. It's, I have a fulfilled life. I'm thriving. But if you don't stand fast in the Lord, I die. It doesn't mean he physically or spiritually dies, but it affects his quality of life. If you live according to the flesh, you will die. It will affect your spiritual life. There is a deceitfulness of sin that can harden us. Sin deceives us. John Owen wrote, Sin always aims at the utmost. Every time it rises up to tempt or entice, might it have its own course, it would go out to the utmost sin in that kind. Every unclean thought or glance would be adultery if it could. Every covetous desire would be oppression. Every thought of unbelief would be atheism. Might it grow to its head. I don't know if that makes since it takes me a couple of times going through that to understand it, but he's saying sin is once it all. Sin wants it all. If sin gets a chance to throw a pass, it's going to go deep, long into the end zone. It wants it all. It wants everything that you'll give it. It's going to strive, it's going to, and it's just inching, 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 and it's like the opposing team in a football game. It'll go by inches. They'll, they'll make short passes, but what's their goal? Are they out there just to have a good time? No, they're not. They're out there to win. And sin is out there to win. You can give it a completion here and there. You can give it a first down here and there, but it's going to take that and it's running. With, it wants it all. It's going to take it all the way to the end zone. John Owen compares it to if you sneak up on a camp, on a opposing army in the night. If, uh, if one side it sneaks up on the other side in the night, two armies at war, and they are able to kill someone of note, a general or a, an officer, what happens after that is instantly the guards awake, they're roused up and inquiries made after the enemy who in the meantime, until the noise and tumult be over, hides himself or lies like one that is dead, yet with firm resolution to do the like mischief again upon the like opportunity. He'll do it again if he gets the opportunity. So it is in a person when a breach has been made upon his conscience in some eruption of actual sin. Carefulness, indignation, desire, fear, revenge are all set on work about it and against it, and lust is quiet for a season, being run down before them. But when the hurry is over and the inquest passed, the thief appears again alive and is as busy as ever at his work. Folks, sin is coming for us. You must be killing sin or it will be killing you. You say, I'm in Christ. I'm, I'm in Him. Yes, but you live on this earth and you have a body. And in your body is this principle of sin. And it wants it all. It wants to dethrone Jesus, if, if it could dethrone Jesus in your life, it would. Believers must kill sin or it will be killing us. And it, when we do that, we magnify God's grace. I won't take the time to turn here, but Titus chapter 2 verse 11 says that the grace of God which has brought salvation has appeared to all men and that it teaches us that denying ungodliness and 
worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and justly in this present age. And we should look for that glorious appearing of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we are anticipating that glorious future with Jesus and we're killing his enemies in our flesh today. What an opportunity to glorify God before we see him. Killing sin before we even see him. Because we want to be as conformed to his image. We want to be as focused upon him as we can. But how is this accomplished? How do we kill sin? We've seen how important it is. We've seen that if we don't do it, it's coming for us. It's going to kill us. It's going to destroy our lives. How do we kill sin? Lastly, I must kill sin by daily renewal in the gospel and scripture. He's going to explain this to us. Next verses. Verse 8. But now you yourselves are to put off all these. And he gives these sins again. Anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy. Filthy communication out of your mouth. Do not lie to one another. And then he transitions right into some very helpful truth here. Since you have put off the old man with his deeds and have put on the new man who is renewed in knowledge according to the image of him who created him. We kill sin when we exchange the old man for the new man. The old man or old self is that former identity. And again, an identity is that which defines our life. It might be that you identify as a victim today. Something happened to you in your life that you had no control over and it was a terrible thing. And you say, I am a victim. Maybe you've come through cancer and you've been healed from cancer and you would say I'm a cancer survivor and that tells us a lot about your identity we know that you've been through a deep trial and you've fought back and and the Lord has healed you and you're a cancer survivor or you could say any number of things about your identity I'm an engineer I'm a hunter I'm a an American all of these things are our identity and We need to be careful about how we define ourselves because we have control over that. If something is so important to us that it slips into our identity and it defines us as as an individual, that can be problematic. And Paul said, you used to have an identity that defined you and that identity is called the old man. It was dominated by this sin principle and it It controlled us before we were saved and it continually corrupted itself in accordance with the deceitful lusts. Go to Ephesians chapter 4 verse 22. Another parallel passage, he is using the same concept here again with with his readers. He says that you put off concerning your former conduct the old man which grows corrupt according to the deceitful lusts. The old man, that old identity is corrupted in accordance with deceitful lusts. It thinks that it knows what it wants. It thinks that if it can just do this, if it can just have this, it will be okay. And it's constantly seeking those things. I was talking with someone yesterday about someone they're trying to help. And he's seeking after something but it's not the right thing. And there's a mentality in people's lives that they get that if I can just have this, I'll be all right. If I can just land this job, if I can just get a house, if I can just do that, and it's all deceitful because once you get that, there's another thing that you need and you're still empty and it's leading you on a path that is set up by Satan just like a choo-choo train track and Satan's leading you over here and he knows where the end is. And it, our old man is growing corrupt according to the deceitful lusts. And the old man dominated by lust though is crucified with Christ. We are now a new creation. And he's given us this new man, this new self. And we don't feel, we don't see any of this. I, you can't check the serial number on your new man. Wouldn't that be nice? Make sure. You know, it's the serial number. Let's look it up. 
um, see if it needs an upgrade or whatever. You know, there's, there, he doesn't do that. But he does give us a new man. He does give us a new self, and it's created after God in righteousness and true holiness because it's joined to the Lord through the Holy Spirit. It's created in righteousness and true holiness. That means when you have a new man, you can't celebrate sin like you once did. You can't stand. It's miserable to be in sin. Christians sometimes can revert, often they can revert to this old man. They can live after this old man, and they think, well, I'll... I'll just do this, and it, I, I just need to discover this. I need to try this out. Young people make this mistake more often than not. They think, if I can just try this, if I can just do this, because I've been withheld from this all my life. There's a reason you were withheld from that. But I've been withheld from this. I could just experience this. It'll be all right, and I'll, I'll be good. And it's deceitful. And they're on the little choo-choo train track, like you have around your Christmas tree. And it, the devil has... Laid it all out, and they're just following the carrot. Choo-choo train, carrot, mixed illustration, but whatever. You, under, you understand what I'm saying. Um, they're just going down the track, and it's corrupt. But the new man, the new self, okay, I was talking about this person who's struggling, and they're following this, this track, but they're miserable. They're miserable in their heart. They can't stand it. They think, just one more step, just one more this, just one more that. They're miserable because they have the new man. And he says, this is wrong. It's created after God in righteousness and true holiness. It's joined to the Lord. This creation of a new man allows the believers to lay their old practices and habits aside. Taking up a new identity and purpose in Christ. He's using an illustration here. Pretty obvious back in Colossians 3 that you put off, put off these things and put on the new man. Immediately we think of clothing. Most people only wear one set of clothing at a time. There are exceptions to the rule, but we won't talk about that. One set of clothing at a time. This is why stores have fitting rooms, because you need to see if that really fits. Yes, you could put it on over your clothes, but it, we don't know if it really fits. And so to try something on, you have to put off something and put on something else. There isn't enough room to wear both sets. And the spiritual exchange here is that we put off the old man and we put on the new man. We kill sin when we exchange the old man for the new man. We also kill sin through the leadership of the Holy Spirit. Back in Romans 8.13, we read this, If you through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the flesh, you will live. Mortify sin through the Holy Spirit. I'd like you to go to Galatians 5.22. Galatians 5.22. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. And those who are Christ's have what? Crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. What he's saying there is if you walk after the Spirit, you'll have this fruit. And we make nice posters and we hang them in our houses of the fruit of the Spirit and all of this. And that's great. We remember the fruit of the Spirit. But right after that, he says, those who are Christ's and have these fruits, they've crucified the flesh. The flesh is out of the picture because they're living after the Spirit. They're living in the Spirit. If we walk after the Spirit, we will not fulfill the lusts, the desires of the flesh. Skip back up to verse 16. Same chapter, Galatians 5, 16. I say then, walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. If you wanted to be grammatically accurate, you would underline that word not. Because he's using words to, he's giving us a double negative in the Greek, which is not what it means in the English. It, it's just added for em emphasis. He's like saying, you will not not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. He wants us to know that, capitalize it, underline it. You will not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. 
The Spirit will pick on our flesh, giving it knockout blows. It will kill our flesh. So you want to know, how do I kill sin? It sounds overly simplistic. There's more to it than this, but let me start by saying, walk in the Spirit. Put on the new man. Lastly, we kill sin through the daily renewal of the new man. Through the daily renewal of the new man. This is where it gets very powerful. The new man, Colossians 3 tells us, is renewed in knowledge. Go back to Colossians 3. Look at verse 10. You've put on the new man who is renewed in knowledge according to the image of him who created him. The new man is renewed. He's built up. He thrives on the truth of the cross. I need to flesh this out a little bit. The new man is one with Christ. He's one with Jesus in death. He's one with Jesus in burial. He's one with Jesus in resurrection. He's one with Jesus in ascension. That's my new self. I'm with Him. And my new self loves it, thrives on it. It's like air. It's like oxygen to my new self, loves it. The old self, when I talk about Jesus and being crucified with Him, buried with Him, dead to sin, alive to God, my old self hates that. And it, it kills him. Think of it this way. We thrive in the warm summer sun by the side of a beautiful lake. Can you picture that right now? I know it's pretty hard. But you're out at a lake and it's warm. It's not too warm. There's a little breeze blowing off the lake. And it's beautiful. And you just breathe in this fresh Iowa air. Nobody's doing anything in their field, so it's really, really, it smells really nice, okay? And you just relax, and you're so thankful that, you're, that you live in Iowa, and you're so thankful to be here on the side of the, the lake. Beside you is a fish that you just caught. And he's on the shore suffocating, drying out, overheating, and dying because he can't stand the world that you live in and you can't stand the world that he lives in that's as stark a contrast as our old and new natures old habits and sins must be taken to the cross in our minds and nailed there well how do we nail them there we nail them there by preaching the gospel to ourselves and glorying in it allowing our new self to be renewed in purpose and vitality according to Christ's image one more passage I'd like you to turn to, 2 Corinthians 4, 13. 2 Corinthians 4, 13. Paul understood this, obviously, and he says in verse 13, 2 Corinthians 4, And since we have the same spirit of faith according to what it is written, I believed and therefore I spoke. We also believe and therefore speak knowing that He who raised up the Lord Jesus will also raise us up with Jesus and will present us with you. I read, I, read, I started too early here. Drop down to verse, well, I'll keep reading just so I don't skip a verse here. For all things are for your sakes, that grace having spread through the many may cause thanksgiving to abound to the glory of God. Verse 16, therefore we do not lose heart, even though our outward man is perishing, and there I think he's referring to his physical body, but I believe his old man is tied in with that as well. Our outward man is perishing, yet the inward man is what, what is happening with that inward man? He's being renewed day by day. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory, while we do not look at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. And he's saying, I am my... New man, my inner man is being renewed day by day. And as we thrive in this warm summer air, if you will, of the gospel, our old self will grow weaker, but we should not think that it's gone because once we step back into that old habit, it will thrive once again. 
In addition to the gospel, we need the entire body of Scripture to grow spiritually. And as the new man thrives, Christ alone is all we want and all we need. Back in Colossians 3, it says that um, we've put on the new man where there is neither Jew nor Greek. And these are things that divide these people. Jew nor Greek, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, that's an extreme barbarian. Slave, free, we're Christ's, and that's all that matters. Because we've changed. And he says, you should mortify your members. Well, how do I do that? You mortify your members by focusing on your new identity in Christ and commit to renewing that identity day by day by day. And you will find that your new identity crucifies your old one. I want to say this as clearly as I can. Perhaps another illustration would help. You've seen tadpoles in the water. A tadpole turns into a frog. It, in the water, breathes through lungs. Or through, I should say, gills. Let's be scientifically correct. In the water, it breathes through gills. But a frog changes and it starts to breathe through lungs. This tadpole would have died on the land, but now it thrives in the open, warm summer air. If the frog were to try to return to its former life and go underwater and just stay underwater, it would die. It can no longer thrive underwater. It's a picture of what God has done for us. He's changed you. Something has changed. As real as a tadpole turning to a frog, something has changed more so in our lives. Our old self cannot thrive in the light of the gospel. And as we take in the light of the gospel, and if we focus on our new identity with Christ, we'll find ourselves killing sin. We, cannot, we can no more return to our former life without dying than a frog can return to breathing water. What would you tell the frog if you could talk to frogs? If he's struggling with his new identity, you would say... You need to put off your old life. Forget being a tadpole. I mean, forget it. Put it off. Embrace your new identity. Frogs don't struggle with that, but we do all the time. We struggle with our new identity. We don't want to be what we are sometimes. Our flesh flies up and it gives us trouble. Our response is to kill sin. We kill sin by taking it to the cross and saying, Lord, this is who I am in Christ. I don't want this anymore. We could get into many, many more details uh, of this, but that is the root. We can, we can memorize verses. I, I just need to say this at the end here. We can memorize verses and we can have counseling and we can write, I will never do this again. And we can determine that we're not going to sin again, but it's like that that person that attacks the army at night and they wait till the commotion is ended and then they kill, go and kill somebody else. That's our sin. What is going to kill sin? You say you didn't talk about memorizing verses. You didn't talk about counseling. You didn't talk about reading books. You didn't talk about all that. That's all included in focusing on your new identity in Christ. That's the way you kill sin. That's the surefire way to kill sin. Focus on your new identity in Christ. That sounds overly simplistic, I realize, but maybe that's why we miss it. It involves the other. But if you take the other without your new identity in Christ, you're going to fail. I know that from personal experience. So the question is, are we willing to live from above? Are we willing to put on the new man? Are we willing to kill sin? Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for this time. Thank you for these lives, Lord, that you have brought together today who perhaps need this truth. Lord, I know I need it. Lord, give lasting victory today. Help us to kill sin by daily renewing our new man, focusing on our new identity in Christ. Give real victory today. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.
like you to turn in your hymnals to 353. Search me, O God, and know my heart today. Try me, my Savior. Know my thoughts, I pray. See if there be any wicked way in me. Cleanse me from every sin and set me free. Let's stand together as we sing 353. Search me, O God, and know my heart today. Try me, O Savior, know my thoughts, I pray. See if there be some wicked way. is going to play a verse just like you to take a moment and ask the Lord to do what you just asked him to do mean it from your heart and if the Lord deals with something right now in your heart would you commit to kill that sin I know you can't kill it we can't kill it but would you kill it through the Lord Jesus and your new identity with him we waste our time if we go from here and we don't take any action Thank you, Lord, for this morning. Thank you for the truth and the power of your word. Go with us now, Lord. Help us. Give us victory over these things. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.